Welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and today we're going to continue a series I started a while back on Vlad the Impaler. And this one is called Blood Oaths. Extra history y'all. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what's going on with uh, Vlad the Impaler here. Ottoman Empire, 1447. This is how Romanian folklore says it happened. When Vlad Dracul was being run down in a marsh, when he knew that he'd be caught and killed by the pretender Vladislav, he gave his sword and pendant to a loyal boyar. Take them to my son. For five days, the boyar rode, evading enemies and crossing rivers, until he entered the Ottoman Empire and presented them to Vlad Dracula. And as the boyar recounted the deaths of his father and brother, Dracula stood staring at the sword and pendant, both given to his father by Sigismund, both marked with the iconography of the Order of the Dragon. And there, the 17-year-old Vlad Dracula swore that he would not rest until he had avenged his murdered kin, and that he would personally, with his own hand, slay the pretender Vladislav. <laughs> I like that music. While the story we started with may be folklore, it does capture a solid truth. When John Hunyadi's invasion killed Vlad's father and brother, it put the teenage hostage into play. Murad seems to have told Vlad of the deaths himself, and then followed it up by making him an officer in the Ottoman military. Because despite the greater popularity of his younger brother Radu, Vlad's seriousness and determination had convinced Sultan Murad that this was the prince they wanted ruling Wallachia as an ally. And considering how brutally Hunyadi and his allies had killed Vlad's family, Murad also assumed that any chance of the young prince defecting to the Hungarians was most likely buried alive with Vlad's older brother. Blood. See, right there is what I talk about uh, when I talk about uh, uh, countries invading others. You don't invade somebody's country and proclaim that you're, going, you're liberating them as they do in modern times. You know, we come to liberate you liberate the family members of their lives and expect them to feel liberated they don't want revenge and they may not do anything about it right then and there but they're going to plan and they're going to want that revenge you know what i'm saying and uh yeah they're going to blame that specific person for doing it but in order to get to that specific person they're going to run through that person's uh how should i put it guards or you know in in in, in this modern times the people to get to them you know what I mean? And if they can't get to them, they're going to uh, instill a lot of uh, pain and suffering to the people around them to try to hurt them or to try to get to them. Let's continue watching. Plus, it was the perfect time to reclaim Wallachia for the Dracul dynasty. For when John Hunyadi and Vladislav marched into Ottoman-held Serbia, Murad had dealt them a shattering defeat outside Kosovo. In fact, the rout was so chaotic that no one even knew if Hunyadi or Vladislav had survived. Seeing his chance, Vlad stormed into Wallachia with a Turkish cavalry force and seized the throne, a dramatic beginning to a powerful and bloody reign. Soon, Vlad would take revenge on the boyars who had betrayed his father and brother and would carve a swath across all of the land up wait, no. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Funny story, Vladislav actually turned up both very alive and with an army, recaptured the throne and sent Vlad back into exile. Wow. His first reign lasted all of two months. At first, he fled back to the Ottomans, but things weren't safe there either. Vladislav, though he'd accepted Hunyadi's help to be installed on the throne of Wallachia under the explicit agreement that he'd fight the Turks, was discovering the same thing Vlad's father had. Wallachia simply couldn't survive against the Ottomans without Hungarian aid, and Hungary was a mess. Soon Wallachian boyars pressured him to make peace with the Sultan. So he sent envoys to Sultan Murad looking to strike a deal. And Vlad, rightfully worried his death might be a condition of the bargain, fled to Moldavia. And Vlad received a warm welcome there. For that year, his uncle had become the ruler of Moldavia and his cousin Stephen the heir apparent. And the three years that Vlad spent there, connecting with his cousin and getting a Renaissance education, were likely some of the happiest of his life. He even got a taste of military glory, helping his uncle and cousin turn back a Polish force. Good days. Though the time was abruptly cut short when his uncle's half-brother assassinated him, and Vlad and Stephen both fled to Hungary, where he was forced to play cat and mouse with John Hunyadi. Going from town to town, hiding with sympathetic boyars, and at one point slipping away just as a squad of ambushers tried to catch and assassinate him. Wow. Then everything changed again. 
First, Sultan Murad died, and in his place rose his more vigorous and ambitious son, Mehmed, who declared it his top priority to finally conquer Constantinople. A goal made possible, since while the city was still a trade center and symbolically important, it had declined in military power. Hunyadi's star was falling as well. While he was still revered as the most famous crusader against the Turks, his two recent defeats had tarnished his reputation. I mean, a few years before, he'd essentially ruled Hungary on behalf of a child king, but now he was back to just being a plain old prince of Transylvania. And then Vladislav. Well, Vladislav was aligning ever closer with the Ottomans, meaning Hunyadi was suddenly shopping for a new prince of Wallachia, which set up an interesting space for an approach between Hunyadi and Vlad, because each did have something the other wanted. Hunyadi could give Vlad legitimacy, official recognition in Hungary, and a path to reclaim his throne. And in turn, Vlad could give Hunyadi an able partner who knew the Ottoman military and leadership from the inside, and who could replace Vladislav if necessary. Striking this deal, however, meant that Vlad would need to join the man who'd slaughtered his family. Mm -hmm. But in an ironic twist, Vlad's father of all people had prepared him for this decision, back when he'd abandoned Vlad as a hostage with the Ottomans. Politics was impersonal, and if reclaiming his throne meant foregoing vengeance, then so be it. Vlad became a noble at Hunyadi's court, and his new patron took him to the coronation of the new Hungarian king, Vladislav the Posthumous, where he took an oath formally to act as an ally of Hungary and the Catholic Church. His role would be the same as his father's, halting the Ottomans' advance and reclaiming Christian lands. And with his oath sworn, the Hungarian Diet charged Vlad with defending the Transylvanian frontier against the Ottomans and their Wallachian allies, a duty his father also held. News of Constantinople's fall in 1453, while no surprise, did sour the celebrations. Stories had filtered in that the Ottomans had impaled prisoners in front of the city walls, a punishment used by both Ottomans and German Saxons as a... Politics is a crazy thing, isn't it? Uh, you have to ally yourself with certain people at certain times uh, just to get done what you need to get done. You know, when you think about it in the Second World War, how Russia and America were sort of allies fighting Germany. And then right after that, here comes the Cold War, you know what I mean? And then, of course, you could break it down to tribal stuff. In Africa, it happens all the time. And, uh, of course, you have uh, the Sunni and the Shiite with the Muslims, you know what I mean? They, they, they're picking sides, which is uh, beneficial to one or the other. But then, later on in years, they would switch sides because one side didn't fulfill what the other side is, uh, had, uh, what that side had promised. And the other side come in and promise them the same things. So they keep switching sides and all that. It's been, you know what I mean? It's like we keep making the same mistakes over and over again to get what we want. When, I don't know, naive, it would be so much simpler just to live in peace. Hey, you're from that tribe, I'm from that tribe. Let's live together and chill and enjoy life. Enjoy this great, beautiful world that we live in. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but instead, you know, we want to control each other and uh, tell each other what to do and, and, and try to force each other to believe that who we are and what we believe is more powerful or more uh, moral, you know, or more spiritually based. And we just keep doing the same things over and over again. Let's keep watching this, you know what I mean? Politics, man. Politics is crazy, isn't it? Way to scare the garrison into surrendering. Believing the city would fall, and wanting to preserve his strength for defending his own territory, Hunyadi opted against sending troops to Constantinople. But he knew that Mehmed would not stop with the bastion of Eastern Christendom, and the next place on the chopping block would be the Hungarian frontier city of Belgrade. So in 1456, he whipped up an army of mercenaries and marched to relieve the city, leaving Vlad to defend the pass into Transylvania and keep Vladislav tied down. Hunyadi's forces reached Belgrade just as the besieged city was ready to fall, broke through the Turkish lines, and managed to get inside the citadel to reinforce the beleaguered garrison. They broke the siege, repelling Mehmed's forces after weeks of combat. Hunyadi, the white knight who had fought the Ottomans for decades, had relieved Belgrade, an event described as a miracle. But a miracle that went sour, as plague swept into his camp, killing Hunyadi and the expedition's other leader. But Vlad Dracula had little time to mourn the enemy-turned-mentor, for his goal had been to tie up Vladislav's forces, and he knew the best way to do it. Invasion. As he crossed into his homeland, 
He looked up to see a fell star <coughs> burning in the heavens. Holly's Comet. A celestial body that people across the world interpreted as either a sign of impending catastrophe or great events. And meeting his enemy's army outside the Wallachian capital of Tarkovishta, Vlad took the burning star as a sign of coming victory. We know little about what happened next. According to one story, the relatively small armies clashed, but in another, the forces decided to settle the issue by single combat. Vlad Dracula, son of the dragon, against his cousin Vladislav, prince of Wallachia. Though in both versions, Vlad slays the pretender with his own hand. When he took the throne, his coins were stamped with the five-tailed comet, the symbol of his victory. But that victory would be difficult to hold on to. Because while he agreed to pay Mehmed 2,000 gold as tribute, and agreed to let the Ottoman armies cross his lands, these agreements were only to buy time for him to build and repair more fortresses and solve internal problems at home. For the faction of boyars who had brought him to the throne were a small minority of the nobility. Most had supported the slain Vladislav, including those who had risen up and killed Vlad's brother at the prompting of John Hunyadi. Indeed, it was only months into his second reign when a young boyar raised an army of mercenaries to dethrone the young prince. But Vlad ambushed the little band as they marched toward Targovishta and made an example of them no one would miss. His troops sharpened long stakes, greased them, and then shoved them into the bodies of the noble and all his male kin. Then he left them, still living, beside the road to die over the coming days. Over time, he would refine this gruesome method of execution until history remembered him chiefly for the brutal spectacle. Vlad the Impaler had arrived, and his enemies would suffer. <laughs> that's right, Zoe. I'm at Ziyad Turk, Elisi. So that's how we got the name Vlad the Impaler. Wow. The Impale people alive. And leave them there so the enemies could see. And can you imagine the fear that would put in the enemy and his own people? You know what I mean? Because it seems like back in those days, and I, mean, I guess it's the same now, how leaders will turn against their own people if their own people don't do what they say. Now, that's some crazy stuff, man. I'll leave a link in the bottom, to the, in the description to this video, you know. And uh, uh, somebody had reminded me to, uh, to keep watching this. I had totally forgotten about it. Thank you for reminding me. And uh, in the meantime, you know, take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.